um, I'll take a break and hand over to uh, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us today on your screen right now. This is me. Uh, my name is Paul. I've been a resident for 20 years. Uh, I've been with Walk Japan since 2012, specializing in the Tokyo area, also doing the Okinawa tour. Um, I've got a 13-year-old son who is uh, playing baseball now. And as you may know, baseball in Japan is a huge sport, as much so as it is in the States. And so it's been quite a learning experience for me going through this process. Uh, and perhaps later on, if we get a chance, I'd be glad to share some of my stories about Japanese baseball and the baseball culture here. However, today we're here to talk about temples and shrines and cracking the code a primer on how to read Japanese temples and shrines. One of the things that I found was uh, on my tours, and I know other tour leaders had the same thing, when people just get into Japan, and if you haven't been to Japan, you're definitely gonna go to temples and shrines. It's a fact of life. They are some of the most magnificent structures architecturally you will see in Japan. They are important historically, and they're everywhere. And so for the first couple of shrines, the cameras are out and people are taking pictures all the time and lots of oohs and ahs, and they were really enjoying it. However, as time goes on, they started to zone out and we started to see people not taking pictures and trying to look for other things and losing interest. And we were figuring out, well, why is this? And came to be, it's simply because most people do not have the tools or the information on how to put temples into context and make them understandable. And they were suffering from temple and shrine burnout. If you've seen one temple or shrine, you've seen them all, and this is not the case. So what I'd like to do today is really give you the tools and the information that can help you understand what you're looking at, put it into context, both historically and culturally, and therefore make temples and shrines more interesting and less dull. And the general temple burnout phase tends to go something like this. You come to Japan, Oh, you see a magnificent shrine. This is Kondo Myojin in Tokyo. And then you go to another one. Well, that's, that's pretty nice too. And then another one. And then let's say you go to Kyoto. Then you see another location and another and another and another and another. And soon you don't know, was that a temple or was that a shrine? I don't know, what's the difference? How can I tell one from the other? And so what we wanna do today is help you avoid that problem and let you understand what you're looking at. So the first steps in cracking the code, what is the religion? And in Japan, there are two main religions. We have Buddhism and Shinto. And without getting into too much de detail and confusing you even more, we'll just keep it simple and keep it this way. Buddhism is a foreign religion. It came in from China. And for the Japanese, Japanese Buddhism is funerary Buddhism. It has to do with the afterlife, going on to the next stage in life, reincarnation, and ultimately going to the getting enlightenment so you do not have to continue to be reincarnated. Shinto, on the other hand, is the native religion, and it is more concerned with the here and the now. It is concerned with the push and pull of nature. Um, if you want a good crop, safe childbirth, prosperity in business, and uh, keeping away from illness, you'll go to a Shinto shrine and pray to the gods for that. So for the Japanese, these two religions are not in conflict at all. They work well together. If you do your Buddhist homework while you're alive, your afterlife is taken care of. If you have problems while you're alive, you go to a Shinto shrine and the Shinto gods will help you out with that. But where do you go to the place of worship for Buddhism and Shinto? Buddhism is practiced in temples and Shinto is practiced in shrines. But how can you tell the difference between the two? How do you get into them? And this is one of the first big clues in cracking the code. A Buddhist temple is entered through a gate and a Shinto shrine is entered, entered through a tori. These are the demarcations between the secular and the sacred. And we'll talk about these later on in detail. But before we get into Japanese temples in, in detail, we need to know about the fundamentals of temple fundamentals. The first disciples of Buddha studied and slept outdoors, but because of India's rainy season, they needed a place where they can study and uh, meditate out of the rain. This is the start of, or the precursor to temples and monasteries. 
These Buddhist groups lived communally and they studied and proselytized and gradually needed living spaces for the monk and gradually living spaces for the monks were created. The first Buddhist temples were only created after the Buddha passed away and all of these early temples consisted of a stupa, which is a mound like structure, and in which the ashes of the Buddha and later the ashes of Buddha's Buddhist monks were interred in and the monastery. This is the viharas and the stupas. There were no statues of the Buddha in these earliest temples. Those didn't appear until about 500 years after Buddhism was created. And the fir at first, they were simply images of Gautama that were placed around the stupa. About the same time that these first statues of the Buddha were being made, a new school of Buddhism was emerging. This was Mahayana. This is the greater vehicle, or as it's known in Japanese, Daijo Bukyo. And unlike the original Buddhism, which believed that there was only one world and one Buddha, Gautama, Mahayana believes that there are many parallel worlds and an equal number of Buddhas, and all of whose purpose is to save mankind. It was during this period that in addition to the stupa and the monasteries, small halls were erected to enshrine other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. This small hall came to be the third building in a temple complex, and it was characteristic of the next generation of Buddhist temples. These are the Chattayas. When Buddhism spread to China, there were changes to Buddhist temples that reflected the characteristic of Chinese culture. Primary among, among these it was based on the tenet that the emperor faces south. Based on this, Chinese palaces were built facing south, and it followed that Buddhist temples would also be built facing south with the statues of the Buddha in them facing south also. Two other characteristics of Chinese layout were also incorporated. One was that as the capital was laid out symmetrically left and right, Buddhist temples in China were designed so that the halls, the monks' residences, etc., were also placed symmetrically flanking the main hall. And the last characteristic was that temples came to be enclosed by a wall with the main gate facing south, just as the emperor's castle in the capital was. So it stands to reason that when Buddhism comes to Japan via Korea between 1522 and 1538, these standard temple practices would come with them. That is to say, we have temples in a south-facing orientation on a north-south axis. They would be enclosed by a wall and the temple complexes centered on the pagoda. Determining a temple's vintage. This next thing we need to do is be able to put the temple into context. And there are two main ways that we can do this. One is the layout and the location of the temple complex. How is the temple laid out? How are the buildings uh, placed in relation to each other? And where is the temple complex itself? Is it in an urban area? Is it in the mountains? Is it somewhere in between? All of these are in, give you information that will help you understand the period in which the temple was built. And the second is the architectural style of the main hall. The building of the main hall itself, its roof, its st structure, everything about it will let you know when it was built. And the reason that I have these two separated is because it isn't, you're not always gonna have a complex, a, a, an elaborate complex around the main hall. There are some temples that exist with just the main hall itself. And this is going to be the vital tool in allowing you to place the temple in Japanese history. There are three basic temple layouts. I'm saying three with an asterisk, we'll give it two or four, 2.5 goes between two and three. And these temple layouts are as follows. One, we have the gate, pagoda and hall all lined up single file running north to south. Next, the pagoda is at the center of the temple with the halls and other buildings surrounding it. And then finally, we have the main hall at the center of the temple with the pagodas flanking it to the east and west. And chronologically, the earliest temples are Gate, Pagoda Hall lined up north-south, and the most recent ones with the main hall at the center of the temple with the pagoda, pagodas flanking it east and, excuse me, east and west. Let's talk about the earliest style here with the pagoda, hall, and gate all lined up in a single file. What we are looking at here is Stenoji, and the construction of this temple started in 593 AD. Uh, in the Asuka period, temples center on the pagoda with ancillary buildings around it. So this main hall is Asuka style. And the characteristics of the Asuka style, it has a Manji Kazushi balustrade, which looks like this. And by the way, Manji simply means, uh, we would call it in English, uh, a swastika, which is a symbol of Buddhism. 
And the columns have entasis, that is, they swell in the center to offset any narrowing that visually might occur if you are uh, distant from them. The next style we have here is the pagoda at the center with other halls and buildings surrounding it. This is what I had just mentioned before, the an ancillary building surrounding it in bilateral symmetry. The placement of the pagoda at the center reflects the importance that it has as the repository for the Buddha's bones. Temples in the Asuka period were built by the imperial family or other inf influential clans. It is important to note at this time that Buddhas Buddhism is the religion of the court and the nobility, not the common man. And it focused on ex uh, esoteric rites, rituals, and a monastic lifestyle. It wasn't until the Kamakura Reformation where the advent of three new sects focused on the simple faith uh, dedicated to the salvation of common man and a lay priesthood that allowed Buddhism to spread to the masses. So here we have Asuka Sedera, and you can see at the center of the temple complex is the pagoda. However, the main hall here is Wayo style. Wayo architecture is characterized by an emphasis on the horizontal and linearity. It has minimal uh, uh, decorations uh, and it has a sense of openness. We have two other characteristics that will allow you to identify a Wayo building. One is the Kairumata. Kairumata means frog's legs. And this is a load bearing decoration uh, that that is, uh, gets its name obviously from the frog's legs. They can be quite ornate uh, with carvings of dragons, cats, and other animals inside the legs. The other very strong characteristic of Wayo buildings are the lattice work windows or the Renji model. These are windows with bars in them who look are, that are diamond cross section uh, when looked at from above and placed at regular intervals. Uh, if a building has a Renji model, it is almost always Wayo. The only exception to this is Sechuyo, which also uses Renji Mado, but comes way later on. And we'll talk about this later because the Sechuyo style is a derivative from Wayo. And here we have a good example of the Kairu Mata and the Renji Mato at Asukusadera. You can see it right here. Next, we have the Hōryūji style, where you have the pagoda and the main hall are starting to get equal billing. In the Nara period, which ran from 710 to 794, the temple complex still runs in the north-south axis, but the main hall and the pagoda now start to be placed across from each other on the temple's east-west axis. This reflects the increasing importance of the main hall, which is starting to be seen as equal in rank to the pagoda. Hereafter, the main hall will gradually become more important, the more important of the two buildings in the Japanese in Japanese temples. Also, during this time, temples came to be surrounded by a wall enclosing the complex and extending from the Chumon, the middle or central gate, which faces south. Buddhism has now become the state religion, and during the Nara period, temples were built at the state expense, and there was a strong relationship between the court and Buddhist clergy. So we've talked about two styles here. I've given this screen here. We have the main hall is what style of what we've talked about previously. If you have an idea, think to yourself, what is the hall? What is the architectural style of this hall? And I'll let you see it a little bit better. We'll take around the outer wall from the lower level so you can see the hall in its basic essence. And then go back here. And the answer is, the main hall is the Asuka style architecture with the characteristic Manji Kazusi balustrades and the columns with entasis. And finally, we'll move on to the last style, the main hall at the center of the complex with pagodas flanking it to the east and west. The main hall style here is Wayo. Once again, very open, very linear with not a whole lot of ornamentation. And in the Nara period, the main hall has become the center of the focus, the center focus of the temple. The location of the pagodas will change in relationship to the, tomb, the, the center, central gate, the Chumon, but the, the basic principle will, will remain. Sometimes you may have the pagodas directly flanking it, or slightly before, as we see here, or even in some cases, you can have the pagodas in front of the Chumon outside of the wall. However, the principle remains the same. The main hall is the central focus of the temple. 
In the Nada period, the temple complex, uh, I'm sorry, in 1794, the capital moved from Nada to Kyoto, with one of the reasons being to separate the court from its involvement with the Buddhist hierarchy. This was the start of the Heian period, and this was considered to be the peak of the imperial court and when the influence of Buddhism on Japanese culture was at its height. Early in the period, two new schools of Buddhist thought appeared, Tendai, founded by the monk Saicho, and Shingon, founded by the monk Kukai. These two sects became major forces in the development of Japanese Buddhism during the Heian period. Both sects believe that the study of and practice of Buddhism should be carried out in mountain forests. And this is one of the major influences that these two sects had on the, the, the design of Japanese temples. In the Han period, temples were situated in the mountains, away from the cities, which is where temples in the Nara and Asuka period had been located. Because large areas of flat level land and mountains are hard to come by and make symmetrical layouts difficult, temples in the Han period were laid out so that they conform to the topography of the, of the land, bilateral symmetry disappears from temple layouts. The Tendai sect and Shingon sect were also instrumental in the Buddhist, merging of Buddhism and Shinto. They espoused the belief that Shinto kami, the gods, goddesses, deities, spirits, were simply manifestations of the Buddhist deities. And from this time until the forced separation of Buddhism and Shinto in the late 1860s, Shinto shrines were located on and in Buddhist temple grounds and vice versa. This is the Jinguji, the shrine temple, and the Chinjuja, this temple shrine. And the reason for this, particularly in Shingon and Tendai, they believed that the Shinto gods were just as foilable as we humans. They had the same faults, the same desires, and they needed to, to learn the teachings of the Buddhas. And this is why they would place shrines on temple or temples on shrine grounds and vice versa. The Chinjuja was simply something at a shrine that would protect the physical structure of the temple. We have two examples here where we can really see how the temple topog or the topography of the mountains dictates how the temple are laid, uh, temples are laid out. These are two tenza, uh, tendai examples and you can see there is nothing symmetrical about them at all. Where the buildings are placed is very, very strongly dictated by the land in which it is built. And then we'll also look at two Shingon examples. So now we're going into the Kamakura period. And despite the flourishing of Buddhism during the Heian period, this was also a time of unease. Uh, many believed that the age of Mapo, the decline of Dharma law, started in the year 1052. And it was in this age that people would be unable to attain enlightenment because they had become incapable of following the teachings of the Buddha. It was in this period that Jodo, pure land, sex of Buddhism, began to gain popularity in Japan. Pure land Buddhism stresses a belief in the Amida Buddha, who promises that all who chanted his prayer, all hail Amida Buddha, with sincerity will be reborn into the Western pure land of bl ultimate bliss. And by being born, reborn into this pure land, people can practice the Dharma more easily and thus achieve enlightenment, since even grave sinners who chanted the Amida Buddha's prayer on their deathbed would be granted rebirth into this paradise. It's pretty easy to see how Pure Land Buddhism became popular in this uneasy time. Pure Land Buddhism is one of the three Kamakura Reformation sects, and we'll talk about one Zen Buddhism in depth later on, and the third I'll mention now, which is Nichiren Buddhism. These three sects really stress that Buddhism, you don't need a hierarchy, you don't need a priesthood to achieve uh, enlightenment, you can do it on its own. And as a result of these, this is where we start to see Buddhism spread to the masses and become the religion of the masses and popular with everybody. So Pure Land Buddhism uh, believes that since the pure land of ultimate bliss lies in the West, Jodo Buddhist temples attempt to recreate this by building temples on the east-west axis. So they've shifted the axis 90 degrees. So rather than running north to south, the temples run from east to west with the main hall to the west and the entrance gate to the east. Ponds manifesting the ideal of the Pure Land also again to be, began to appear in temples during this time. And these ponds placed in front of uh, Jodo shrines are a characteristic, but they are not exclusive to them. Here we have the example of Byodo in Kyoto. 
and the example here is Hasedera in Kamakura. These are both Jodo, pure land sect temples. And if we look at the maps here, you can see the compass rows are pointing to the right here, which lets us know that we are in indeed on an east-west axis here with the main gate to the east. So in the Kamakura period, society begins to shift away from the court and ability and the focus and the mainstay of society becomes focused on the warrior elite. This change brought a rise in the popularity and influence of Zen Buddhism. Zen believes that enlightenment comes not from without, not through the study of sutras or rituals, but from within and in the midst of everyday life through meditation, self-reliance and personal experience. This outlook fit in very well with the warrior mentality with its focus on simplicity and restraint and with an emphasis on physicality. Both Zen and Bushido, the way of the warrior, prized discipline and orderliness in all things. And as Zen increased in popularity, regular symmetrical temple design began to return. Another characteristic of Zen Buddhist temples is that they're built in the Satoyama. These are the border areas between the mountains and flat arable land, and they are always surrounded by nature. Since discourse with the master and disciple is very important in Zen, the most important building in a Zen temple is not the main hall, but it is the lecture hall, the Hodo. Zen temples, uh, also feature a large number of practical buildings such as dining halls, commodes, and sleeping quarters. And as might be expected, on Zen temple grounds, there was a new architectural style that developed, and these are called Zen Shuyo, the Zen style architecture. And these are very distinctive. They came over, were brought over from China, and characteristics of this style Primarily, you can tell by the roof. The edges flare out in a dramatic curve. Next is sugegumi. These are block and cap support brackets. And kibana. The kibana, which means uh, nose flower in this case, is an architrave. It is an architectural design uh, decorative feature that plugs in to the supporting column and comes out. And originally, these were uh, very, very simple, simply re repeating arcs or curves, uh, but they became quite uh, ornate, uh, like becoming with lions, dragons, and other animals. Now, another thing that you'll notice with Zen temples is the roofing material is often thatch or cypress singles, shingles. This is in contrast to most other temples. Almost all other temples will have roofing made of clay tiling. And this is another thing that will help you identify a temple, whether it be a regular uh, temple that is not Zen or a Zen temple. The temple that we're looking at right here is uh, Eheiji in Fukui. And this is classic uh, Zen Shuyo design, but the temple itself is now Shingon. And while this looks quite simple, uh, other, another characteristic of Zen temples is the main halls can be often quite ornate and quite colorful. And we'll see an image of that in just a bit. Next, the architectural type of the main hall. This is another key to determining when the temple was built. And we've got four main designs. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to lay out the four designs in chronological order, but we're not going to talk about all of them in chronological order right now. So the first one we have is Wayo, which we've discussed previously. So we've got the emphasis on horizontal, horizontal and linearity with the Kairimata and Renjimato. Next is Daibutsuyo. We'll talk about this in a second. Then we go to Zenshuyo, which we've just talked about. And we can see here, and the image here is, this is another classic design for a Zen temple. Very, very colorful. And then finally, the fourth style is Setsuyo. Now, since we've talked about Wayo and Zenshuyo, we'll get rid of those and we'll talk about Daibutsuyo. Like Zenshu, uh, Daibutsuyo was brought over from China, but it was only in use for a short period of time, from 1180 to about 1206 AD, and it was brought over by a monk by the name of Chogen. Um, Daibutsuyo uses the minimum amount of materials to make the largest building they can, and they give the viewer an impression of strength and power. Another feature particular to Daibutsuyo is the use of sashi hijiki. Uh, 
This is an elbow or bracket that is inserted directly into the supporting columns. Uh, sashi hijiki are often stacked one atop another and they're used to spread the load of the roof over a wider area and support the eaves. Another feature of the daibutsuyo are the kurikata, which is the, the precursor to the kibana that I mentioned before. And here you can see it is simply a repeating arc or a curve. Next, we'll talk about setsuyo. This is the four style, and this is uh, a blend of daibutsuyo and zenshuyo. And then after the introduction, after its introduction in the late Kamakura period, this becomes the mainstream style. And since it is a blend of the two, it has characteristics of both daibutsuyo and zenshuyo. Um, like, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, like wayo and daibutsuyo. Like wayo, it has the kairumata and it has the renji mato. And like daibutsuyo, uh, or like zenshuyo, it has the kibana. The main thing to remember here is this has become the mainstream style. So. Most of the temples that you will see, particularly in Tokyo, Tokyo are going to be Setsuyo style temples. Now, while we've talked a lot about the, the main halls, there are other, some other important uh, architectural features of a temple that are quite important and will give you hints and let you understand a temple in Buddhism a little bit more. So we'll spend a few words talking about pagodas and temple gates. First, we'll talk about the pagoda. Used to be the main star, but now is a bit plater. Uh, the pagoda is the origin of all Buddhist buildings and is the, is the emblematic building of the Buddha. They take them, their form from the stupa and they are blended. The stupa merged with the Chinese rokaku, which is a multi-story uh, gate, and they become multi-story towers. There are four types that can be found in Japan. And we'll talk about the last one, the, tah the tahoto, the many jeweled tower first. This is the rarest of them. You don't see them very frequently. It appears to be a two-story tower uh, from the outside, but internally it is a single story. The other three types we have are the three-story, the five-story, and the 13-story. There are no longer any existent five-story uh, pagodas in Japan. There are many three-story pagodas, and these are what you will see more often. And then the so-called 13-story pagoda. Uh, that is simply a, a nomenclature for it. If it has 9, 11, 13, 15, it will be called a 13-story pagoda. Pagodas are fundamentally composed of the soding, which we're looking at right here, which is the finial or spire on top of the structure, the roof itself, the tower, and the base. All pagodas are topped with a soding. And this is the most defining characteristic of a pagoda. But the most important part of the finial, of the, the soding, is the part at the top, the jewel, the hoju. This is the portion where the, Buddhists, the Buddha's bones or other relics, fingernails, ashes, etc., are kept and so represent the heart of the pagoda. Below the hoju, we have the yusha, which is the dragon vehicle or the vehicle of the nobles. And below that, below that we have the suyen, which is literally translated water smoke. This is a symbol of veins set perpendicular to each other and designed to look like flames. The purpose of this is to ward off and prevent fires. Below that, we have the kuring, the nine rings. And this is a series of nine rings encircling the central finial. And these, they represent the five Buddhas and the four Bodhisattvas. Below that, we have the base of the finial, uh, and that is three parts. The first is the ukebana, which is usually designed in a, a series of upturned, eight upturned pedis, lotus petals. And then below that is the soding, uh, is the fukubachi, uh, the inverted bowl-shaped stone, and the roban, the dew basin, which acts as the foundation and connects the soding to the roof. Now, although pagodas are meant to be enjoyed from the outside and, and they, nobody can get inside them. That doesn't mean that they are plain on the inside. Quite the contrary. The inside of the pagoda is the Buddha's world. And as such, it's very richly decorated. The columns are covered with paintings and images of the world of Buddha. And there are generally five statues or five Buddhist statues in there, uh, but they're not available to the public. The image we're looking at right here is from uh, the pagoda in Toshogu in Niku, Niko, and it is available to the public for a small fee, I think 300 yen. You can go behind the pagoda and look into the window and see this.
Uh, and the, the Buddha statues, the five Buddha statues represent the five wisdoms, wisdom against anger, desire, envy, ignorance, and pride. The next thing we'll talk about are the gates. Uh, and this is the first thing you encounter when, in, uh, when entering a temple, the entrance into the complex. Um, and while it is no longer the case during the Maori period, as I had mentioned before, walls were built around the temples and they were, had to be entered through this gate. There are three types of gates. Um, and as we go through this, as the gates were added, the first you have the Nammon, the Nandaimon, which became the Sanmon, then the Chumon going in. And then there's a third type of gate called the Chokushimon. Now, in addition to their physical roles, they also have considerable symbolic value uh, importance as well. And before I talk about the, the two that have the most uh, symbolic uh, importance, we'll talk about the Chokushimon, the Imperial Envoys Gate. And as the name suggests, this was, this was a gate that was used by Imperial Envoys when they were visiting temples or other high-ranking court officials. It is not open or used by the public. And if they do exist in a temple, they are often the most spectacular and more high, most highly decorated gate. Uh, they're also called the Karamun, the Chinese gate, and they can be identified not only by the lavish design, but also by the gabled roof. So the Sammon and the Neomon are the two primary gates. Uh, and they what they do, uh, let us know that we're entering the world of the Buddha. While all are welcome, to enter and follow the path of Buddhism, a temple's gates mark the division between the everyday world and the enlightened world of the Buddha. It is only fitting then that the temple's gates are solemn and made to be a bit difficult to enter to ensure that people are put into the right frame of mind. The stone step running over under the gate and the columns dividing it are physical symbols of division between these two worlds. So the Sanmon, uh, originally it was Nanmon, Nandaimon, the south gate or the main south gate became the Sanmon. And the San in this case is a homonym uh, for two very different gates. The first is the Sangay Datsumon, uh, the gate of the liberation from the three earthly desires. And this is what we're looking at right here. So the gate will be built so that there are three entrances to it by passing through this gate. One can be emancipated from the three passions of avarice, anger, and ignorance through the study of Buddhism. The three portals are also analogous to the paths needed to be liberated uh, from the world of uh, illusion. The first, ku, emptiness or selflessness. Two, formlessness, muso. Three, mugan, desirelessness. The second case, samun, the san means mountain. And this is a reference to the temple's uh, Buddhist name its mountain name. The custom originated in China and show that temples and were built in mountains. It is used even for temples that are built in urban areas or flat areas to indicate that while physically not in the mountains, temples are still separate from the worldly or the earthly. The mountain gate will often have the, have the temple's mountain name written in a frame and hung from the gate. In this case here, we're looking at Sensoji in Asakusa in Tokyo, and the temple's official name is Kinyuzan, which is written right here. Next, we have the Chumon, the central gate, or the Neomon, the Diva King's gate. The Neo were the guardians, the bodyguards of the Bodhisattva, of the Buddha. And so they are quite fierce and they are always two of them. And one of them will have its mouth open with its arm up, wielding its weapon very, uh, very broadly. And the other has his mouth closed with his weapon held back. This is the contrast between overt violence and latent power. The open mouth, the ah, is called the ah form. The closed mouth is the um form. And the ah is the sound that a baby makes, the wailing of its first cries. Um is the sound of a dying man's last breath. And together they become aum, aum in, the, in Japanese, and then the aum in, in uh, Indian. The beginning and end of all things, the alpha and the omega. And this is what their position symbolize. So now we have the tools and information we need to ask the questions, to answer, to ask the questions that we need to put our temples in the complex. The things we need to ask are, where is it? Where is the temple itself located? <clears throat> where is the pagoda? 
Where is it in relation to the other buildings in the complex? <clears throat> and what is the main hall telling me? What is the architecture of the main hall telling me about when this temple was built? And perhaps even what is the sect that this temple complex is? Most temples are lined up on a north-south axis with the main gate to the south. However, Pure Land Buddhist temples are, access, are oriented to the east and west with the main gate to the east. The earliest temples have the pagoda at the center and buildings will be surrounding it. It is during the Nada period that the main hall becomes the center of the temple complex with other buildings, the pagodas, laid out symmetrically opposed to it on an east-west axis. Note, at this time in the Nada period, most temples are located in urban areas. If a temple is located in a mountainous region and has no clear symmetry, it is likely to be a Tendai or Shingon temple and was built during the Heian period. <clears throat> also, if there is a shrine near or in the temple grounds, it is very likely to be Tendai or Shingon. Zen temples begin to appear in the Kamakura period with the lecture hall as the focus of the temple complex and symmetry, uh, symmetry begins to return and the temples are surrounded by nature and they're located in those areas, the Satoyama areas between cultivated lands and the foothills of the mountains. <clears throat> Next, we'll move on to Shinto, but like talking about temples, we need to talk about the fun fundamentals of shrine fundamentals. When you go to a shrine, they will have all or some or most of the, these characteristic features. They'll be entered through a tori, and we'll talk about this because this is an important clue as to the, the shrine's background. You'll often have stone stairs. You'll have the sando, the pathway leading up to this. And I'll give you a little connoisseur's tip here is the sando going up to the haiden, the, the worship hall and the, and the, the sanctuary, the honden, do not walk in the center of this. The center of the path is for the gods. We mortals, normal human beings should walk to the left side of it or the right side of it, not in the middle of the path. The next we have the chozuya, which is a water basin used for ritual pur purification. And then we have the stone lanterns, the toro. And the toro themselves uh, were originally placed in temples, but after the merging of Shintoism and Buddhism, they came to be placed in shrines. Uh, and they were often established through the contributions of the worshipers. So they speak to a shrine's history. We'll leap over the next to the Emoden, which is the votive plaques, uh, and the Shamusho, the, which is the, the shrine administrative office. And we'll go to the Sesha and the Masha. Uh, the Sesha is the auxiliary shrine. Deities with a deep connection to the or relationship to the main deity enshrined in the Honden, the sanctuary, are enshrined in the Sesha. The Masha, or subordinate shrine, deities with an older lineage than the ones enshrined in the sanctuary are enshrined here and are often Jinushigami. These are the local resident deities. They're protecting the land that the shrine was built on. They are the original deities of the land or ground that the shrine was built on. Then we come to the Haiden. The Haiden is the worship hall. It is often placed in front of the Honden and is a larger scale structure. It is the most often seen structure in a shrine. Almost all of them will have a bell and an offering box placed in front of them. Then we have the tamagaki, which will surround the sanctuary itself, and then the honden, or the sanctuary itself. There are two other structures that are often found, but not listed here, and I'll point them out now. One, oh, 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 I want to go back. I want to show, you, show that to you. This is the Zuijin Mum. This is the, the guardian de deity's gate, and we'll talk about this in a second. And the second... There is another type of wall, and this is the one from Nezu Shrine in Tokyo. Then this wall will go around not only the Honden, but also around the Hall of Worship and the Koma Inu and the uh, Emaden as well. So now we know what, to, what structures we'll see in a shrine. But even before we get to the shrine, the Shakaku, the shrine, shrine ranking, will help us understand. A shrine's name is a very important key to the importance of a shrine and where it falls within Shinto hierarchy. So here's the shrine denomination. Jingu, shrines with a deep connection to the imperial family or shrines with members of the ancestors imperial family enshrined in them are Jingu. For example, Meiji Jingu. Uh, Gu, 
shrines with people connected to the imperial household or who had high social status were enshrined in them. And the classic example of this that most may know of is Toshogu in Nikko. This is the shrine where Tokugawa Iyasu is enshrined as a deity. Now, using the gu, uh, well, had to, permission had to be given from the emperor. And prior to 1645, Toshogu was known as Tososha. However, it got permission from the emperor and thereafter became known as Toshogu. I'm going to loop back a little bit here and go to Jingu. Prior to World War II, Jingu could only be used uh, with the emperor's permission. However, after the war, although the naming restriction was removed, only shrines with a special lineage are given this rank. Uh, the most famous Jingu in all of Japan is Ise Jingu. However, strictly speaking, Ise Jingu is its common name. Its official name is simply Jingu. Next, we'll go to Dai Jingu. This is a branch of Issei Jingu. For example, if you're in Tokyo and you can't get all the way to Isu, uh, Issei to offer your prayers, you can go to a branch, a Dai Jingu. Next, we have Taisha. Uh, this is applied to large shrines that are central to a region's faith or belief, or that are the head shrine of another of other locations throughout the nation. For example, Fushimi Inari Taisha. Similarly to Jingu, uh, when you talk about Taisha by itself, this refers to Izumo Taisha, which itself is the common name. Its official name is Izumo Oyashiro. And for those who are connoisseurs of kanji, this is read here as Taisha, but you could also read it as Oyashiro. This kanji itself can be read as Yashiro. Then we have Jinja. This is your most common standard type of shrine. And then finally, Ja or Sha. This is an abbreviation of Jinja, a Jinja for relatively small shrines applied to shrines that have deities transferred there from larger shrines. And in the scope of things, we go from the bottom to the top, the lower rank to the top. Jingu is the highest rank. The Tori. This is how we get into the shrine. This is the demarcation of leaving the physical world and going into the spiritual world. There are two types of Tori. We have the Shinmei type and we have the Myojin type. And in its most basic sense, Myojin is just referring to divinity in general. This is defined at shrines. In contrast to this, a Shinmei shrine is a shrine that is devoted to Amaterasu, the sun goddess. And in their most basic sense, tori are composed of three components, the kasagi or the lintel, the nuki, the supporting cross beam, and the hashira, the pillars supporting it. And if we look here, particularly uh, for the myojin type, there are other characteristics you will see here. The kusabi that also have the daishi, the kamebara, uh, that will let you know of a Myojin shrine or a Myojin Tori a uh, little more in depth. However, if we were going to talk about the general characteristics here, Shinmei type shrines will have a straight upper lintel that will be round in cross section. The pillars are going to be vertical. It that doesn't have nuki that extend past the supporting pillars and it is often made of wood in its original state. More often than not, there is no Gakuzuka or Shingaku which is the, the name where the name of the, the shrine will be located. Myojin type tori will have curved upper lintels and they will have two of them. They'll have the kasagi and the shimaki. And in this case, they're going to be either square or pentagonal in cross section. The pillars are going to be inclined inward and the nuki are going to extend past the supporting pillars. They tend to be painted, often vermilion, and they will almost always have a Gakuzuka or a Shingaku. Now, now that I've told you this, I want you to keep in mind the only two things that will not vary are Shinmei Tori will have the straight upper lintel and Myojin type will have the curved upper lintels. There are others will be mixed and matched. There are, I believe, 16 different types of tori, and there are exceptions. For example, the Kashima tori is a Shimmei type tori, but it has the nuki extending out from the side of it. Going further, the Munetada tori has the nuki extending and has the, shing, uh, the Shingaku on it. Contrast to that, Nakayama tori 
has is a myojin with no extending uh, nuki uh, on the uh, the hashit of the pillars. So there are going to be exceptions of this, but if you're going to quantify that, qualify it, look for the lintels. Also, uh, I have found that the tori can vary regionally. For example, where I live in Funabashi, to the east of Tokyo, almost without exception, shimei type tori have the columns canted in. I don't know why, but that seems to be the case here. So as you go from area to area, you might find characteristics that are different, would lead you to believe one is the other. But just be, keep in mind there are exceptions and remember that the lintels are your biggest key for identifying the types of shrine tori. Next, we'll talk about the Zuiji Mom. And you thought that gates were for temples. They are, but you will often find that uh, shrines also have gates. And we have two examples here, and they look almost identical. However, one is for a shrine and the other is for a temple. Looking at this, you won't be able to tell. So to make it easier for us, I'm going to choose two different gates. We have the Zuiji Mon and the Neomon, and this is a way we can tell the difference a little more clearly. If we look here, you can see these two individuals. This is a Zuiji Mon, and looking at the example here, this is a neomon. And the figures in the Zuiji mom are the Zuijin, the, the guardian deities. And the one on our left is called the Yadaijin, and the one on our right is called the Sadaijin. And these are the ministers. And what they are, they're dressed in imperial clothing, the court imperial clothing, and they will always have a sword and be carrying bows and arrows. In contrast to this, in a Neomon, we will have the Diva Kings, the Neo that I talked about before, the Agyo and the Umgyo. And as we can see here, the one on the right has his mouth open, the one on the left has his mouth closed. Generally speaking, the Agyo will tend to be on our right as we're looking at it, and the Umgyo will tend to be on our left looking at it. But this is not always the case. They will sometimes be reversed as they are in, uh, As uh, in Sensoji and Asukusa. Next, we'll talk about Chigi and Katsugi, or Mr. or Miss. Um, and this will let you know the gender of the deity enshrined in the, in the shrine. So we have two types of Chigi. We have the Sotosogi and the, the Uchisogi. Sotosogi is O Chigi, and this is where the cut is vertically. And this will represent a male deity. The second is the Uchisogi or the Meichigi. Uh, this is for a female deity, which has a, a horizontal cut at the top. Next, we have the Katsugi. And this is another clue as to the, the gender of the deity enshrined. So if it is an even number, it's a female deity. And if it's an odd number, it's a male deity. Uh, and there was used to be a convention to this during the Han period, Taisha had eight Katsuogi, Chusha or mid-rank shrines had six, Shosha or lower rank shrines had four, but that system is no longer in existence. For reference, going forward, Issei Jingu has 10 Katsuogi, Izumu Taisho has three, Kasuga Taisho has two, and both Yasukuni Jinja and Meiji Jingu have seven. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. So the example we have right here, we see we have the Uchisogi, and it has 10 Katsuogi, and this would indicate that this is a, a honden dedicated to a female deity, and that is indeed the case. This is the Naiku at Issei Jingu, and the shrine itself is dedicated to Amitarasu. Next, we have Sotosogi with an odd number of Katsuogi indicating a male deity, and that is indeed the case. This is the Honden at Meiji Shrine, the shrine dedicated to the Meiji Emperor. But if we look at this, we can clearly see that we have the Sotosogi and an odd number of Katsuogi. But this is the shrine at Issei Jingu Geku, the shrine 
secondary shrine at Issei Jingu. And enshrined in this honden is Toyouke Bime, a female goddess. So this was quite a mystery to me. I didn't know why this was happening. And I was convinced there had to be a mistake. And I was talking to a colleague and he was kind enough. He actually called Issei Jingu and they assured him without mistake, this is indeed to a female deity. There would be, it's unthinkable that a male deity would be enshrined here. All this goes to show that there are exceptions uh, and there's no real hard and fast rules to Shinto, similar to the Tori. There's also cases where you can have Uchi Sogi, the horizontal uh, 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 Sogi, uh, with an odd number of Katsuogi, uh, for example, at Nukisaki Jinja in Guma Prefecture. So these are good general rules. They are not ironclad, but it will help you get a sense of who the deity is at the shrines that you go to. Next, we have got the Honden. This is the sanctuary itself. And as you can see, there are many, many types of them. Uh, I believe there are 19 different types of sanctuaries, but what we're looking at right here is we are looking at the main uh, nine styles, and they can be classified broadly into two categories, the Tsuma Iri and the Hira Iri. The Tsuma Iri is with entrances that are perpendicular to the ridge pole. So for example, if we look at this one right here, we can see the entrance is perpendicular to the ridge pole, letting us know that this is Suma Iri. And this type of sanctuary, Honden, was developed from houses or residences in ancient times. The other is the Hira Iri, example here. And this is where the entrance runs parallel to the ridge pole as seen from above. Now, generally in shrines, roofs are made from thatch, cedar, or cypress bark shingles or copper plating. Clay tiling is very, very rare. This is in contrast to temples where it's the opposite, where clay tiling is the main roofing method. So this is another hint, another clue in cracking the code that will let you identify a shrine from a temple. Now, since the honden, the shrine is often very hidden, can't be accessed or seen by the public, you will only see the haiden. There's really no sense in talking about the honden anymore. So we'll just skip ahead. Actually, I'm lying. We're going to talk more about the honden because this is another important clue in cracking the code. There are two main types of, or two main classes of uh, the sanctuaries. The first is those developed pre-Buddhism. Sumiyoshi style, Shinmei style, and Taisha style. And the way that we can tell that these are uh, pre-Buddhist is they will have the chigi on the top, and they will have the katsuogi as well. Next, we'll look at those developed post-Buddhism. And here we have the six main styles. And on these, the main characteristic that will allow you to identify them is the fact that the roof has a curve to it. Also, many of the styles here uh, are influenced by Buddhist temple designs, particularly Sengen and Hiei constructions. You can see the influence of Buddhist main hall architectural styles quite strongly in them. But you may have a question here, but Paul, you said that pre-Buddhism styles have the Chigi and Katsuogi, but that post do not. But the Kasuga style here does. That is correct. It does indeed. This is the only one that does have the Chigi, but it has the curved roof. And so for those of you even paying more attention, you'll look at the Taisha. Yeah, but Paul, you've got the Chigi and the Katsugi, and you have a curved roof. Yes, but in this, the entrance is offset. So these are the ways you can differentiate them. Two other points I'd like to make here. The Nagare style construction, this is the most common and ubiquitous Honden style that you will see. It is located throughout the nation and particularly in those smallest shrines will be of this style. The second one is for the Gongen construction. This is a shrine, a shrine 
Honden style. And everybody who was enshrined in the Gongen was once an actual living human being who has been enshrined as a Shinto deity. Example of this is Toshogu uh, in Nikko, and also the Tenmangu, uh, who uh, Tenjin, uh, Sugawara Michizane, was a court poet, has been enshrined in a Gongen uh, Tsukuri construction. Next, we'll move on to the Koma Inu. These are warding off evil. And these were brought over from China with Buddhism. So you can occasionally see them in Buddhist temples. One of the best examples of these Koma Inu are at Ninaji in Kyoto, very dramatic. They evolved into the paired Koma Inu in the Heian period. And they were originally used to stop doors and sliding screens from rattling. And they were carved from wood. However, they started to be placed on the Sando of shrines between the late Muromachi and early Edo periods, and they were carved from stone to better offset the effects of rain and weather. And strictly speaking, there are actually two animals. One is the Koma Inu, the lion dog, and the other is the Shishi, the lion. And in China, in China the Shishi was the most noble of the beasts and was the first of the two animals. And you can differentiate between the two in the following ways. The Koma Inu will be located on the left-hand side, and the Shishi will be located on the right-hand side. The Shishi will have its mouth open, the A ah form. The Koma Inu will have its mouth closed, the M um form. The Koma Inu may have a horn, as in the example we see here. Its ears will be pointed or standing, and its mane is straight and or loosely curled. And if it is colored, it will be traditionally colored white. The Shishi will have its ears flattened or drooping, and its mane will be very tightly curled, and it is often colored yellow. Uh, there are many, many styles of Koma Inu, and there are a lot of people, websites here in Japan, where people go to search these out, but the symbology is important. So, for example, we have the Tama Osai, or the Tama Tori, which is a Koma Inu holding down a ball or playing with a ball, uh, which means that it, the meaning is to have fortune roll your way, a symbol of family fortune and prosperity. The Tama Nori, the example we see here, standing on a ball, again, a symbol of family fortune and prosperity. The tamakue, holding the ball in one's mouth. The kotori, example that we have here, uh, holding down a smaller koma inu, is for the perpetuation of your descendants. Uh, and then there's also a third style that we have. It's called the Edo style koma. And these were developed during the Edo period. They have much smaller eyes, a very curled beard, beard and they have a strong, bold design elements on them. For example, peonies or a very, very fluffy, flowing, long tail. There are other animals that we can find uh, at shrines as well. And these are the divine familiars. These are known as Shinshi in Japanese. Foxes. And so the animals and the deities can be very are very strongly related. So a fox is an avatar of the deity Inari, the god, goddess spirit of agriculture, rife, rice, birth, industry. And often at the Inari shrines, you will see the fox having various things in its mouth. For example, here we have the fox holding the key to the warehouse. And this is a symbol of wealth, fame, abundant crop, the realization of wishes and your desires. Next is holding a scroll. These are the Buddhist sutras. One holding the jewel in its mouth. And this is representative of realization of wishes and desires. And then finally, a sheaf of rice which is symbolic of a, a good harvest, an abundant crop. Next, we have the cow, and this is an avatar of the god Tenjin. And Tenjin, as he was known, or he's known now in his life, was Sugawara Michizane, a court poet who was exiled. Uh, and when he died, his remains were placed on a cow. Some stories say the cow moved by itself. Others say that the cow was pulled by, Michi, uh, by Tenjin's disciples. And the cow would move, and then it went to a point where it would go no further, despite being pulled by its disciples. It was thought that this is where Michizani's spirit wanted to, was happy, and so he was buried at that location. And this is where the first uh, Tenmangu spread up. Also note that the dates of his birth and death are all cow-related the year of the cow, the month of the cow, and the day of the cow. Next, we have the rat. And this is the avatar for 
the deity, uh, the Buddhist name for the deity is Daikoku Ten. The uh, Shinto name is Okuninushi. And Okuninushi was tasked by Susan and O'o to three ordeals in order to win the hand of his daughter. Okuninushi won the first two. The first night was sleeping in a room with snakes. The second night was in a room with bees and uh, centipedes. And for the third, he had to enter a field into which an arrow had been, with a whistling head had been fired. He had to go in and pick it up. When he entered the field, the, uh, it was set afire and he didn't know how to escape. A rat came and helped him find an underground cave where he waited the fire out. After that, the rat brought him the arrow, which Okuninushi then gave to Susanoo and thus completed the ordeal and won Susanoo's daughter's hand. And another example is the rabbit, you'll see. And this is the avatar of the Sumiyoshi Sanjin, the three gods of Sumiyoshi, who are said to be enshrined by the Empress Jingu in the year of the rabbit, in the month of the rabbit, and on the day of the rabbit. There are other animals as well. For example, the wolf or the egret is the avatar of Yamato Takeru. The pigeon is the avatar of Hachiman. Uh, Oyamukui has a turtle. Bishamon, is, the avatar for Bishamon is a centipede, and for Benzaiten, the goddess of music, love, water, things that flow, is a snake. And next we'll talk about Shimenawa. This is the rope that demarks sacred spaces and objects. And the origin of this starts with Amaterasu being lured from her cave, Amano Iwato. Um, she had gone into the cave because her brother, Susanoo, who was very, very crude and had played pranks on her. And she got so disgusted and aggravated, she went into a cave, hid there, and the light from the world disappeared. However, she was lured out when other uh, uh, Shinto deities were dancing and telling jokes in front of the cave, and she got curious, decided to come out and see what it was, and when she left the cave, Futodama sealed the rope with the cave so she could not get back in, and so light returned to the world. So, Shimenawa have two functions. One is to demark an area that is sacred, that humans shouldn't enter, and two, that the encircled object or place is occupied or possessed by the gods. There are three types of Shimenawa. The first is the Maidare Shime. This is the most common type you see, and you'll see in shrines everywhere. It is used for Jinji Sai, the ritual purification of a Buddhist site, as well as we can see here being hung from Tori. It has uh, the Shime Noko, the strings, and the Shide, the folded paper on them. The other two types are, we have the Daikon Shime, which is thick in the middle and narrows to both ends. And the one we're looking at here is the most famous one. This is at Izumu Taisha. And then we have the Gobo Shime, which is thick at one end and narrows towards the other, usually going from right to left as seen by the observer. So now we have the tools that we need to ask the questions that will break the code for shrines. First, what type of shrine is it? What is the name telling us about the shrine? Is it an Amaterasu uh, shrine? And what is the sanctuary telling me? Is the deity enshrined of it male or female? Is it pre-Buddhism? Is it post-Buddhism? So to recap, Jingu are shrines for members of the imperial family. Uh, or somebody who's of high court, hold, uh, court status. Gu are shrines for people connected to the imperial, high, uh, imperial household or individuals who had high social status. Shinmei type tori are located shrines dedicated to Amaterasu and by extension to the members of the imperial family since they are all descended from Amaterasu. Pre-Buddhist Honden will have Chigi and Katsuo on the roofs, asterisk. Post-Buddhist Honden will have roofs with curves, two asterisks. However, the exception is Kasuga construction will have Chigi and Katsuo, but the roofs are curved. And Taisha construction Honden will have curved roofs, but with an offset stairway. Uh, stairway. Gongen style Honden are shrines dedicated to people whose souls have been enshrined as deities. And then finally, statuaries and sculptures of animals aside from the Koma Inu will help identify which deity the shrine is dedicated to. So that wraps up my talk on 
uh, breaking the temple code. And hopefully I've given you the tools and information that will allow you to get a better idea of what you're looking at and place the, the shrine or the temple into context and make it more interesting and prevent the dreaded temple burnout uh, and allow you to 